Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, you're signed up for the ASA Industry Forecast webinar with Alan Bolio. I'm Mike Gettelizzi. I'm going to be the session's moderator today. Just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, up on your screen, you should be able to see the ASA Supplier Partner screen. We'd like to uh, uh, call attention to them and thank them for the support they've given ASA. And, and it's through that support that we've been able to launch new programs like our forecasting uh, program with, with Alan. Um, you're currently muted. Uh, only Alan and myself will be able to, to uh, speak. Uh, the session is going to last approximately an hour. Uh, Alan will take questions throughout the presentation. So if you think of a question, uh, go ahead to the question box that you should see on your dashboard and type in the question. We'll see the question, and then we'll interrupt Alan and, and ask that question uh, as you think of it. Should you fall asleep during the next hour presentation, which I'm sure none of you will, but just in case or you have to break away from your desk, uh, ASA is recording today's session. Uh, it'll take about 48 hours to make it available on the ASA website. Uh, you'll be receiving an email from us letting you know that it is available so you can share that with others within your company or go back and, and review it yourself again. If you can't get enough of Alan, we're going to be doing a, the second webinar on August 14th at the same time, 11 o'clock Eastern time. Also, Alan will be attending Network ASA in Washington, D.C., uh, beginning part of October. Details will be out uh, probably in the next two, three weeks for registering for the network. Uh, he will be attending and giving the 2014 forecast uh, at that time. Uh, this is part of ASA's uh, uh, for, uh, forecasting program. We've got a pretty good uh, background of great business intelligence. Our OPR uh, is out now for, for data collection, so you should have received information about participating in that. Uh, currently, ASA is partnering with the other regions and 33 other industry uh, distribution organizations, we'll, and we're going to be conducting a compensation study, which the results will be out at the beginning of uh, 2014. Um, as I said, the forecasting program was launched uh, last year at Network ASA in Orlando. Uh, every month since then, ASA has been providing you through email the ASA advisor, uh, which comes out monthly that Alan produces for us that gives you month-to-month -month, uh, updates uh, from his forecast. Uh, in addition, today's webinar is one of two that Alan would be presenting for ASA as part of our forecasting program. Um, again, our presenter is Alan Bolio. He's president of Institute for Trends Research. ITR has boasted a 94.7% accuracy rate since 1948, and it, and it has had 60 years of correct calls. It is the oldest privately held economic research and consulting firm in the U.S. Allen is one of the country's most informed and correct economists. He has been consulting since 1990 with companies that have both a domestic and global perspective on how to forecast, plan, and increase profit based on business cycles trend analysis. Pronouncements from Allen have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, USA Today, Knight Rider News Service, Business Week, AP, and numerous other outlets. Allen has, uh, has been retained uh, along with the professionals at ITR to provide ASA member firms with their insight about the trends you need to be aware of to stay relevant and successful in the future. This time I'd like to introduce Alan Bolio. Alan, take it away. Thanks, Mike. That was very nice of you. I appreciate that, and uh, it's good to be with you, and thank you to all of our uh, supplier partners and for their sponsorship for today, and I am indeed looking forward to being in Washington uh, in early October. It will be a great time to be there, and I'm sure we will have lots to talk about because that's a never-ending stream of interesting information. Uh, let's get to uh, work. I'm going to skip this one in the interest of time. Uh, if somebody is not new to ITR, this will be, uh, excuse me, if somebody is new to ITR, this will be of interest to you, but in the interest of an hour and want to leave plenty of time for questions, I'm going to go past that and go right into hopefully how you uh, will use this data to your benefit. Uh, it's one thing to know where the economy is going. I can certainly help you with that. It's another to make sure that you apply it internally. Again, our team at ITR Economics is, stands ready to, to help you with this, this process. Uh, it's a function of taking your data. Uh, your monthly data is called raw data. It's just your monthly data and converting it into rate of change. Once you find your rate of change, you can begin to f compare yourself to the uh, economy, macro trends, find leading indicators, 
And it's also a way for me to explain the terminology we're going to use today uh, for those of you that aren't intimately familiar with ITR economics. So we take your monthly data. We, we quickly shift it into a three-month moving total, which is a self-explanatory term. You just compute it every month. And then uh, using this year-over-year -year comparison method that we've outlined in front of you, we, using that formula shown on the upper right-hand part of the screen, we come up with a 312 rate of change, the most current three months divided by the one year earlier. That's the uh, derivation of 3 over 12. Uh, so we're 10.5 percent above where we were a year ago. Uh, in and of itself, that's just a data point. But when we track it through time, it begins to reveal a lot of information. That can be kind of noisy, especially at the company level. So we will use today a lot, a 12-month moving total, uh, divided by one year earlier, giving us a 12-12 rate of change. Uh, this is your primary tool. And at the company level, you want to make sure you use both 3-12 and 12-12 rates of change. When we do a trend cast for firms, we make sure we use both. The most common mistake with people doing this on their own is that they forget the value of the 312 rate of change. Again, in an hour webinar, we're not going to go through it all. This is uh, part of what our book, Make Your Move, is all about. This is part of what we do, and we're happy to answer questions about it. But today, I just want to introduce you to the concept, make sure you understand where a rate of change comes from. We're comparing uh, data. The monthly data converted into quarterly moving data, annual moving data, so we can see where an economy, an industry like housing, or where a trade association or an individual company is going. We compare that data to lead indicators, as I've mentioned. This happens to be the Purchasing Managers Index. Find a great cyclical identity. I mean, uh, this probably just makes you want to weep for, for the beauty of it. Uh, we time adjust, and you can see how well this works and how it gives this firm a view into the future. We combine that with uh, what's happening in the world around us, news and market observations. Undergirding the whole process would be ITR's long-term business cycle theories, which are unique to ITR. Uh, and as we apply this methodology, we come up with the forecasts. And Mike was very kind to mention our accuracy over the years. Last year, in 2012, our accuracy rating on over 500 industries that we forecast globally, uh, industry series, not company series. Uh, for 12 months out, we had an accuracy rate of 96.2%. Uh, and it was just as strong in Europe as it was in, in the U.S. Other foreign nations can use this as well. The point being that this methodology, these four blocks, they seem rather simple, what's happening internally and externally in our theories, but it renders results that I hope you can take to the bank quite literally as it enhances your profits and enhances your position in the marketplace. All right, let's talk about what's happening in the economy. And uh, I think, if nothing else, you're going to leave today encouraged uh, about 2013, and you're not going to be discouraged about 2014, which is going to have a, a reality check when it comes to 14. Uh, the first comment I want to make is, is about that text box down towards the bottom. We have had a data revision by the Federal Reserve Board in March. It did not uh, change our forecast in terms of the 12-month moving average, which is uh, obviously similar to the 12-month moving total we just discussed. It's just it's an average one extra division. Uh, it did change the rates of change, but it did not change the forecast. Now, that, that sounds like I'm speaking like a two-handed economist, but it's because there are two things involved. There's always two moving pieces. The 12-month moving average trajectory has not changed. The, uh, the percentage change of 14 compared to 13 has uh, been lessened. We were calling for a 2.9% year-over-year decline, 14 to 13. Now we're looking at a 0.6% decline. Uh, we've always said it was mild. Uh, this is just showing that it's mild. In effect, the data is catching up with our projection. We're going to see a flattening, in essence, in 2014, mild recession in com consumer activity, very mild. And that's going to be true of housing, too. It's going to be more of a flattening to a very mild decline. Nothing to upset you, nothing like 2009, not even close. So uh, when I say the word recession, I hesitate because a lot of people mentally are going to jump right back to 2009. It's not that. Look at the number for the economy. It's, it's minus 0 0.6. That number in 2009, uh, the, the trough was at 14.6. So uh, there's no comparison. And in 2015, the economy expands again. That includes housing. That includes you. Uh, you're going to be looking at a nice uh, few years in through here. It's not going to be 2006 7 but you're not going to mind this. Just be careful about straight line forecasting. Straight line forecasting will, will allow for a misappropriation of capital resources, too much inventory as we head into 14. That's your biggest danger at the moment. When we look at what's happening in, in uh, terms of, of 
Well, all of a sudden, I can't go down anymore. Let me see if I can unlock this thing. Mike, there we go. There's the forecast presented on a rate of change basis. Uh, again, it's just pictorially to show you how mild the decline is. When I compare the economy, and please remember this graph. This becomes important. I blew past it, but it's, keep a mental picture of how 2014 is just a small decline. When we look at the wholesale trade industry and the, specifically the NAICS code that relates to um, ASA members, 4237, uh, we find that there's a great cyclical identity. So my rather encouraging outlook for 2013 and 14 for the economy translates into a similarly encouraging outlook for the industry. ASA members should experience growth in 2013. The industry should grow by 3.9. Hopefully you'll do better than that. 2014, the growth rate for the wholesale trade industries uh, related to that NAICS code 4237 is going to slow to 1.3%. So just plan on a slower rate of rise unless you have a lot of market penetration going on. Unless you're doing something extraordinary, you're just going to see the rate of rise in your sales numbers slow. You're not going to encounter any problems. When we look at the wholesale trade industry in terms of dollars, which is the bottom blue line, nice rising trend going on. You can see where it has stopped rising in the most recent month. When you look at the top two trend lines, those are the rates of change. Those are the business cycle pressures quick course on how to read these four line graphs and I think you'll have it uh, forever. The top two trend lines, if they're going up, that means whatever we're looking at at the bottom has got upside business cycle pressure. It means that there's something that's going to keep moving that higher. Mathematically, it, it's just the way that it works. When those top two trend lines are moving down, it means there's some downside business cycle pressure. Now, it could mean things are just leveling off, essentially, as they did in 2007 dramatically milder rate of rise, or it could mean there's a recession like 2009. Uh, my job is to determine which it's going to be, and again, it's by looking at what's normal, external leading indicators, news, and what's happening in the world, and by looking at our business cycle theories. Now, when you look at the top two trend lines, you can see that they're curling downward. There's definitely downside business cycle pressure in wholesale trade of hardware, plumbing, HVAC equipment, and supplies. That means that the rate of rise, at the very least, the rate of rise in the dollar spend, which is right now at 109.3 billion, is is slowing down. Uh, the outlook calls for it to just uh, basically slow in its rate of rise uh, through the rest of 13 and 2014. Think in terms of that 2007 period where there's no great gains to be had. There's nothing exciting going on, but at the same time, it was nothing like 2009. It just meant you're going to basically, and for all intents and purposes, plateau. Uh, if that was going to change, we'll certainly let you know in, in the uh, ITR advisor reports that come at you or at the next webinar or in Washington. But right now, every indication is you're going to continue to sales rise, but at a slower pace. I circle back around to that because, again, my biggest fear is that uh, you'll have a tendency to overestimate results for the second half of 13 and for 14. Our reasons for recovery are pretty straightforward. Uh, there's no mystery here. Everything that you want to have happen is happening. Banks want to lend. Now, the Fed is being stimulative, which is not good for us long term, but it is certainly uh, helpful to some extent, or it has been in the past anyways, uh, to some extent. We are in an improved position as far as exports. We're more cost competitive than we've been in a long time. There's no liquidity problems in the U.S. We're not uh, highly leveraged. As a matter of fact, we've deleveraged, and we've done everything as business and consumers that you'd want to have uh, happening. It's there, and it's, it's very good news indeed. Uh, when we look at construction spending, that's residential and non-res. Residential is certainly stronger than non-res, but they're both on the upside to some extent, and that means the economy and your business is going to continue to expand. Uh, you may have read recently about the Fed notes, Federal Reserve Board meeting notes being released early. Uh, besides the fact that that was an interesting moment, it really doesn't impact anything. Uh, it does not appear any insider trading went on because of that. What the notes tell us is that the Fed is growing more uh, hesitant to continue to have the gas pedal mashed to the floor like they have now at $85 billion a month. Uh, it's appearing to the thought that they will slowly ease up on that uh, bond buying program as they go through the second half of 13 and perhaps even end it by the end of 13. That thought is gaining momentum. Good news. Uh, we think it's certainly good news. A, it means that they believe the economy is strong enough, and B, it lessens the inflationary pressures that we'll see out into the future. 
Uh, so look for that to happen. As an aside, when that happens, it's my belief this is not an ITR forecast. I repeat the word not because the stock market is not something we forecast. It's my belief that there's a lot of air in the stock market right now. Uh, when everybody and their brother is rushing in to take advantage of record high numbers, it's a good time to think about heading towards the exit. And if the Fed, which I believe has had a lot to do with the gains in the stock market by providing all that liquidity, if they are no longer providing the liquidity, I think that will have a deflationary impact on the stock market, which is something we've been telling our readers about for the last uh, few months. I believe it was two months ago, uh, Brian stated in the executive summary to the ITR Trends Report, that it's time to head to the exits or at least go defensive. Good advice. We're coming towards that point where an inflection point is likely and the S&P 500 industrials and a bear market is likely to show up in the second half of this year. Uh, so watch the Fed. We'll watch it for you. That's better. And we'll let you know when that's happening. But it is a cautionary note at the moment. Let's take a, a yes. Do, Alan, Mike? Alan, this is Mike. We have a quick question before you go to the next slide uh, from Bill. How, how does the sure. president's budget and the fact that we had 88,000 jobs in March uh, affect your outlook? Uh, well, those are two very good questions, and the first answer is the president's budget is an interesting one, and I want to give him credit where credit is due. He's got some very good line items in there, if, he, if it's sincere, and if it's actually something that will see the light of day in Congress, there's some things that I think everybody can agree to. Um, uh, chained CPI for Social Security, some cuts in, in Medicare increases, uh, increasing uh, the to the tax rate from 20% to 30% on uh, hedge fund managers, uh, the Buffett rule, uh, those are not all bad things. The Buffett rule is just something I'm morally against just because I, I think it punishes capitalism. But nevertheless, I think most people agree with it. Uh, its impact on the deficit is purely symbolic. There's so little money actually involved in that that it won't change anything. But nevertheless, uh, it'll cause some forward momentum in other budget pieces like the reduction in defense, the reduction in different parts of the federal budget that can be reduced, including the mandatory spends. Uh, the raising of taxes on the uh, upper income people, uh, that's $600 billion over the next 10 years, so it's not insignificant. It's actually greater than the savings that would come to Social Security because of the chain CPI. Over $500 billion of that comes from limiting deductions to high income earners. Uh, if that flows through to businesses, that's painful. Uh, so the president's budget, while it has its good moments, also has some pain in there for high-income individuals and I suspect for flow through businesses. Because other than Dave Camp in Michigan and a handful of other people, nobody spends a lot of time thinking about, uh, the NAW does, thinking about sub-S and, and other uh, LLCs and other flow through entities. So the answer to that question, while complicated, and I apologize for its length, is the budget doesn't change anything. It has some good news, it has some bad news, and because nobody likes it, it's probably not a bad compromise. Uh, the uh, other question related to what, Mike? I've forgotten. It, it was the uh, jobs report with, uh, looks like, 80,000 jobs in, in March, which was significantly below where it, we needed to be. Does that change? Uh, yeah, so actually that's consistent with the forecast, so thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> we, we have been calling for a slower rate of rise in job creation as we go through the rest of 2013. 88 is on the light side, there's no doubt about that, but the fact that it is less than expectations is entirely within ITR expectation. Uh, we expect less job creation because of uh, the coming of Obamacare and because of uh, the profits uh, of corporations, which have been reduced year over year. Last year, they were like 3.7% for the first quarter. This year, they're 0.7%. Uh, so the, the, the changes in, in profitability, the, the looming Obamacare costs, uh, the changes in, in employment status, the number of hours that now constitutes full-time for Obamacare re, uh, purposes, 30, all of that has a negative impact on jobs and is something we've been telling folks about uh, for the last couple of months. Uh, so thanks for bringing it up. Uh, right on target with our outlook. Expect to see more sluggishness in job creation as we go through the second half of the year to be a tip-off uh, to the stock market uh, outlook and to the actual forecast for the economy. Less jobs Great. created, harder on retail sales. Great. Thanks, Alan. Sure. Mike, thank you. Uh, interest rates, you know, that, that little tick on the right-hand side, that blue line bouncing up, that's hard to call that the beginning of a cyclical shift because the line's fairly noisy. Uh, nevertheless, it's being held down because 
because of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, we think there's more upside pressure than downside pressure coming on mortgage rates, and that uh, if you want to go out there and grab a mortgage, now's the time to do it. Uh, I've talked about this with you in the past uh, to greater length. All I want to show you today was that it's beginning to happen, as we had talked about. And it'll be a very uneven rise, just as it was a very uneven decline since the early 1980s. Uh, but it looks like it's beginning, and it's time to move on those interest rates, as we discussed when last uh, we were all together. Reasons to be concerned. And I don't mean to be uh, a downer here, but there's certainly plenty of reasons to be discerned. I'm not, we could take a half hour just on this, and we don't want to. So let me run through them with you. Uh, Cyprus and Europe. Uh, man, every time I try to get excited about Europe, they do something like Cyprus. If you wanted to guarantee a, a way to make sure that capital does not flow back into an economy and into a banking system, you'd use a Cyprus model, and maybe it'll be called that. Uh, the basic lesson there is your money's not safe. Uh, it can be confiscated at any time, and don't bother to save it where it can be publicly seen because it'd be taken from you. Start using underground economies or uh, in anticipation of these types of Cyprus rules, take your money out of the country and put them in Switzerland or in the Grand Cayman if you happen to be in the U.S. Uh, the, the Cyprus was, uh, you know, it's a little economy. It doesn't really matter except to uh, Russian mob, which about 40% of the investments uh, in the banking industry in Cyprus is probably related to criminal activity. Uh, but they punish 60% uh, of the total for that. Bad move, dumb idea. And if it becomes a European model, I'm going to have to change my outlook for Europe. Uh, it has not become the European model, so I've not changed my outlook for Europe. It's not going to fall apart. The Italians are another story. The Italians being unable to settle on a new government. Uh, the socialists not being able to agree on how to form the new uh, coalition government. The rejection of Monti and his austerity. Uh, that shakes my uh, outlook also, but it doesn't cause me to change it, but I am being very cautious about it. We are looking at flat, flat, and flat for Europe, and when that changes, if it changes, I will certainly let you know. Right now, it still looks like we're holding with 0.8% gain in Europe for this year, essentially flat. Let's move to China quickly. Uh, China has announced recently that they want and are striving for slower growth over the next few years. Uh, it's a very good thing to see the writing on the wall, then respond to it. <laughs> <laughs> but China will be going through slower growth. That's actually one of the reasons why we've changed our outlook for oil for 2013. It's because China will be going through a slower rate of rise. Stimulus package is going to be let out more slowly than originally announced and anticipated. Instead of a one-year shock, they're looking for a five-year plan. And that means they will dem be demanding less supplies of copper, less supplies of oil, less supplies of everything as they go forward, eliminating some of the upside pressure that we had anticipated on commodities for 2013. That's good news for consumers, it's good news for businesses, bad news for uh, China. The China is importing more than they are exporting, uh, showing some of the shift in the cost basis that I mentioned earlier. They're not going to cause a recession in 2013, neither are they going to be able to be a lot of help in 2014. And it, just a little aside, this probably didn't make your radar, unless you really track China closely, uh, Fitch Rating Service just downgraded the internal debt, which is an important distinction, the internal debt to A- minus in China. Uh, they are highly leveraged, and as we have just seen in the U.S., Europe, Iceland, other parts of the world, highly leveraged can equate to bad news all of a sudden. And Fitch has decided that the official and unofficial debt internally to China is indeed worrisome, and they have downgraded them to A-. minus. That's a big change, and that's uh, not insignificantly a loss of face. Nothing new on the legislative front. We've talked about that before. Dodd-Frank, Obamacare, still in play and still of concern for 2014. Uh, Israel and Iran, no attack has taken place. Um, it looks like oil is going to be a little lighter in price than we had talked about before, and that is certainly good news. Fiscal cliff, the sequestration is a lot of noise. It is a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty, but it is not a lot of actual action. The amount of the U.S. budget that is being talked about is rather uh, minuscule, as is saving $1.8 trillion over 10 years, the president's new plan. Uh, when you're talking about spending $38 billion over 10 years, if spending were to remain constant, which it never does, but let's assume for the sake of argument it does, $38 trillion being spent, $1.8 trillion being saved. It's on this year 
in DOD and in other areas of the economy will have a negative impact, slow the rate of rise in 14, but there never was a cliff and we're not going to feel it in 14 either. The tax hikes are real. Tax hikes are coming. More tax hikes are coming. All of that has a negative impact on business investment, business spend, especially since there are a lot more of us that are flow through corporations than there are that are C corporations. So the tax hikes do have a negative impact slowly through time. It's not, again, not a massive impact. It doesn't cause a cliff, but it's not good news either. And as far as the deficit and, and national debt goes, that's a long-term problem. But I thought you'd like to know that the fourth largest budget item we have in the U.S. right now is interest on our debt. And these are at record low interest rates. The Fed is selling uh, $13 billion in, in debt today. Uh, the 30-year debt will be at about 3%. That's guaranteeing long, long uh term money at below long-term uh, CPI rates, consumer price index rates. Uh, that's good for us as a people, uh, but it won't last. In the future, we'll be seeing more and more money being spent on interest rates. Right now, it's 6.3 something percent of the budget that'll have to go up in the future. That becomes problematic, but don't let it worry you for 2013 or 14. We're financing at low rates, thanks to Uncle Bernanke at the Federal Reserve Board. Europe is not falling apart. We've discussed that. I want to show you the good news. The Europe leading indicator is moving up. So if you want to leave this meeting with something most people don't know in the world, and that, that is that the European leading indicator is saying that the uh, recession is coming to an end right around when we said it would. The global leading indicators are not robust, but at least they're moving the right way. As you can see from the uh, EU manufacturing PMI, which is that uh, tannish line, and then the deeper line from JP Morgan manufacturing PMI, they're both beginning to tip. That's consistent with our outlook for that sluggishness in 2014 and recession in Europe in the second half of 14. Investment. Uh, they are not as worried about the future as a lot of Americans are, and therefore uh, it's not likely to fall apart either. When we look at the world, there's a lot of green going on. That green is not going to drive up a lot of price uh, pressure in the near term. Uh, again, look at the top two lines to tell you where the business cycle pressure is. The 12, 12 rate of changes in blue. The quarterly pressure is in that uh, brown line or orange, whatever that is. All you can tell from this is that there's not going to be a, a, a spike in material and, and components for construction. You're not going to see all of a sudden inflation coming at you, so there's no need to worry about stocking up on inventory. They're not going to get shocked on, on contracts. You're not going to get all of a sudden uh, turned upside down in contracts because your, your purchasing is, is going to become out of whack with longer term commitments. Uh, you're fine, and uh, you're not going to find yourself uh, in any difficulty this way. Plan on very mild 2.5% uh, price increase is something we've been living with for several years. More of the same as we go forward. You've been doing it. You've been doing it successfully. Just continue doing it, and you'll continue to be successful. The U.S. economy is showing signs of beginning to tip. Housing, which is up on the upper right, is the third word from the right, uh, has actually tentatively shifted over into phase C, which is that uh, browner section on the right-hand side where you see the word financial and retail. We are beginning to see the big three tip over to the back side, signaling that we are on track with it, something happening late this year and in 2014. That tip over does not, and I emphasize does not mean recession, uh, but the mildness of the downturn that we're calling for in consumer activity seems to be beginning to happen, playing out, and that includes the housing industry, which we're going to get to in just a moment. Uh, do not head for the exits as far as our outlook on the economy or your anticipation of some good days ahead because B2B activity, as shown here on this graph, those two orange lines, they're positive. That's good news. That means that there's spending going on. It means that the economy is going to continue to uh, advance in 2013. They're going to turn negative soon. You're going to give up its upward momentum before too long. But for now, it certainly uh, speaks to more upside activity for all of us, as does the ITR leading indicator. That orange line is moving up. Uh, it's been uneven, but it tends to move and wander that way. As an uneven rising trend, it's telling us that 2013 will be a good year, and we should not expect any difficulties until that orange line begins to move down in earnest. We'll let you know as soon as that happens. That's part of the indicators that we watch for you, and we'll be reporting out to you. 
this is proprietary to ITR, developed by my brother, updated uh, recently by, by the team. Uh, what we have found is that this is a very accurate leading indicator. So if you want to tell people how you know 13 is going to be good, now you know. It's the ITR leading indicator. And when you start telling them about 2014, you'll know because the ITR leading indicator will signal it as will several other indicators that we have available to us, like the consumer confidence, consumer expectations indicator. This comes from the University of Michigan, but this is not the monthly data that you hear about in, in the news. This is the monthly data converted into rate of change. As we discussed that methodology earlier, it's just a, it, it's a mathematical progression. It's not the first and second derivative, but if you like that sort of thing, it's very close to that. What we find is, is that the, that negative bias that you see in front of you, that purple line moving down, that's signaling that consumers are facing some hesitancy about the future. When we look at what the Federal Reserve Board looks at, we can see that they're not worried about a recession because they're still above that black line across the, the screen at minus 0 0.7. When that line continues to move down, they'll become more cautious about the future, and that may give the stimulus folks all the ammunition they need to keep the stimulus spending in place. Uh, we'll let you know about that as we go forward. The reason that's important is because it impacts mortgage rates and because it impacts future inflationary trends. But right now, they have to be thinking, hey, the world's a pretty good place. We should be thinking about backing off. We all look at the Purchasing Managers Index. I'm sure you look for it when it comes out in the news. I know we do. And the P PMI, that Purchasing Managers Index, that's coming down. But look, it's still well above 50. It has to move down into that circle zone before you even begin to worry about the future. So it's saying don't worry about the second half of 2013, or at least until late 13. Uh, this is saying you know, the world's a good place. Enjoy it. Push product out the door. Tell your salespeople there's no excuses, all that sort of happy management uh, input. Uh, PMI is a very good indicator. We'll watch it closely for you. Right now it's saying we're good, as is the US composite leading indicator. On a rate of change basis, it's signaling some difficulties uh, coming a year from now. But I thought you'd like to see the actual monthly number. It's moving up. Uh, that's encouraging for 2013. And I want you to be encouraged by today's call about what's happening over the next eight months. Uh, just don't get too enthused about 2014. We've already discussed the stock market. The annotate at the bottom, I think that's something that we need to pay attention to. Share prices are up 10%, but earnings are only up 0 0.7. That's a lot of air. And I think the rates of change are beginning to reflect some of that air. When the rates have changed, those, that blue line especially begins to bend downward. If it begins to bend downward, that means at least stabilization in the S&P. Uh, 500 index. So if you're in an index fund, it looks like your your rise is coming towards an end. Um, and if you're heading towards retirement in the next uh, five or seven years, you may want to think about going defensive uh, because they may not leave you enough time on the other side to bounce back from a, a correction that we believe is only a quarter or two away. Alan, uh, let me interrupt real quick uh, in case uh, the participants have any questions for you. Uh, they can go to their question box on their dashboard and type in the question, and when we see it, we'll interrupt and, and read that question. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and do that now. Thanks, Alan. Sure, Mike, anytime. You know, I like the questions. I think that's a, a good part of what we do together. Uh, let's take a look at retail sales while we're waiting for those questions to come in. Let's see the rates of change on top, how they definitely have a, a, a droop going on, and how the 312, that orange line, is below the blue line. That's key. Now, that's not uh, to be minimized. That says that there's some headwind in retail sales. Now, you can have some headwind like we did in 2011, and it doesn't mean a recession. It just means things are slowing down and sometimes imperceptibly. Uh, it do, we do see here that there's some headwind of some kind building in retail sales. Now, what consumers do is ex obviously extremely important to everybody on this phone call. Now, we believe that a lot of this is due to uh, you know, uncertainty. A lot of this has been due to the press and sequestration and fears about you know 40,000 teachers losing their job and and uh, janitors losing their job and all the jobs and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, but there's also a component here that has to do with the FICA tax being rolled back up and the FICA tax going back to where it should be. And I'm certainly not saying it should not have gone back up. It does have an impact on discretionary spending. Disposable personal income is a function of after-tax income. And what we do with our after-tax income is, is, like the federal government, some of it's mandated. We have 
contracts, mortgages, rents, etc. that must be met, car payments, credit card notes, and then there's discretionary spending. Uh, what we can do with the money after that, which we tend to spend, uh, we can actually we uh, save, we invest, we spend, we give it away, not in that order, we spend first. It would seem like there is some headwind coming, slowing down the rate of rise. At ITR, we think we're going to see that 12-12 sort of move horizontally into uh, for another quarter and then begin a slow decline. We're not going to see a big recession like we did in 2008 and 9 in retail sales, but we are going to see some flattening in retail sales and that flattening in retail sales will have an impact on ASA members because that will be an indication that consumers are just not going to be parting with a lot of money. They can't because they're out of thousand dollars because of FICA. Uh, average income in the U.S. is a little over 50,000. Two percent of that is a thousand. Usually two people working in a home so that means the, or there are a lot of homes that will be out two thousand dollars in, in after-tax income. Um, that's significant. And two thousand dollars in after-tax income multiplied by uh, the number of people working is a significant amount of money. That slows the economy down. Right thing to do, but you can't pretend it does not have an economic impact. Uh, if it had a uh, bolstering impact going in, and it was stimulative, then you can expect that it has a reverse impact as it's coming out. And we're beginning to see that part and parcel with the economy and the economic outlook, I should say, for 2014. Housing starts. Let's get to the meat of the matter. See that 12-12 rate of change on top and the 3-12 rate of change? They appear to be crowning. Now, the 3-12 did that just a little while ago. You can see that in, in, in on the screen in front of you. We have a double crown. But now the 12-12 has got a tentative high in January 2013. We'll wait and see whether that develops for sure. It certainly wouldn't surprise us. Uh, how can we continue to see housing starts uh, grow by 27.9% a year? The answer is uh, it's really an unrealistic expectation. A slower rate of rise appears imminent in housing starts. Now, we we're, we're have a nice, statistically, that's a great recovery going on. Visually, it doesn't do much for you, but I'm sure you've all appreciated it. We've appreciated it. It's nice to see housing inventories go down. It's nice to see housing prices go up. And it's easy to look at this and go, hey, you know what? This is just going to last. We've, we've solved the problem. We don't think so. Uh, we don't think it's going to last. We think what we're going to find is that rate of change is indeed curled over. Uh, if it's not this month, it'll be next month or two. And as it, that 12-12 begins to decline, it'll show us that there's downside pressure building on the housing recovery. And the housing recovery is, is going to, uh, we believe, do this. We're going to see a much milder rate of rise in the second half of this year. And we're going to see... Uh, back to mildly negative trend in 2014. It will technically be an end to the uh, housing recovery at the end of 2013, followed by an extremely mild, and I hate to use the word recession because of the screen in front of you with 2007, 8, 9 looking the way they are, but you know, just a, a mild easing off in 2014 before it begins to build again in 15. Uh, 15 ish should begin to build again uh, because of inflationary pressures pushing people back into the market because of the demographic trends where more of our kids will have kids, younger people in their 20s, early 30s will start having kids. That pushes them into homes. People want to rent single-family homes. Um, uh, all sorts of good things will be going on. And, and uh, as the economy begins to gain momentum, banks wanting to lend, people wanting to buy, the housing uh, market will come back. It's just... Do not take the percent gain that we've had, 27%, and double it up for 2014. Uh, gross misallocation of resources and way too much inventory. Uh, this is a good time to be thinking what your C inventory should be looking like as you go forward and uh, what you should be doing as far as uh, building market share uh, to get you through 14 with a nice rate of growth, opposed to just leveling off or seeing a few point decline in 2014. When we look at different regions, west, northeast, etc., cetera, uh, you can see nice double-digit gains. New homes sold. Uh, how can you not like that? Existing home sales slowed down to 9.8%. Uh, excuse me, wrong term. Uh, slower at 9.8%, but the next column shows a phase B, which means it's accelerating, it's rising. So while 9.8% doesn't uh, light us up, uh, there's uh, money being spent in people buying homes. Uh, existing home sales are uh, being tied to what's happening in construction home improvement. Construction home improvement is something we're going to take a look at in just a second. But it's all encouraging. Slower rate of rise beginning to develop in construction home improvement. But with rise, rise, rise going on across the country, there's opportunity, there's good news. Um, 
for everybody in this phone call, no matter what region you're from. When we look at what's happening in the different ASA regions, in the Pacific region, uh, residential construction is rising, even though there's a mild decline going on in commercial construction. And again, the ASA's definition of the Midwest, uh, there's rise going on. Thank you, energy industry, while commercial construction is slipping a little lower. In the north central region, both residential and commercial, going up. In the northeast, residential is going up. And there's mixed reactions depending on what city you're in, in the commercial side in the northeast. But as a region overall, it's mildly positive. If you're in the south, uh, residential is rising, commercial is flat. If you're in the southwest, the great southwest, rising and rising, commercial and residential, good news. And that means that overall, uh, you should see, no matter where you are, increase in the residential side of your business and the commercial side of your business. You may see it beginning to slip away. Uh, it's not going to fall away. There's no tremendous decline. There's no crash coming, but you should see some of that uh, slipping away only through the near term. Uh, 2014 is not a, uh, a significant uh, worry for you. You know, mild, mild, mild negative pressures coming back. There's money to be spent. Uh, economic energy is not uh, leaving us in droves. You're going to find that overall your business is stronger on the residential side through the near term, probably a little stronger on commercial side in 2014, and both uh, very positive in 2015. Congratulations. It's good to be you. Here's home improvement construction spending. Uh, as I said, it's beginning to show signs of slowing down. These rates of change are signaling that. 9.1% rate of growth is good. Historically, it's, it's certainly been better, but if this is a good, solid rate of growth, lots of money being spent is the important part. As I annotated there for you, $124.8 billion and rising. And uh, as consumers are wanting to nest, fix up, buy, and fix up what they're buying, do additions, uh, it's good news for everybody on the call. Congratulations, people are spending. Now in 2014, not going to be spending so much towards the end of 2013. Not going to be as happy to spend. So grab the business, make sure you're doing due diligence as far as what customers want, do your marketing, and uh, you should find yourself holding your own, as I said a, a number of times, uh, 2013 posting some nice gains, 2014 holding your own. Uh, watch those rates of change, we'll watch them for you obviously, but pay attention to them, and this would be one you want to compare to yourself. See how much of your business is tied to, to rehab uh, or new uh, uh, additions, alterations, home improvement uh, permits, etc. All right, multi-unit housing slowing down, not a lot, but it is slowing down. 35.9% uh, year over year is a tremendous increase. The bottom 12-month moving total showing a, a nice rise in the number of units. The uh, number of units is going to continue to gain. Our outlook there is just calls for a decelerating rate of rise. We're going to see a growth rate by the end of this year of 18.5% if you're selling into multi-unit. Next year, 2014, just up 3.7%, but that's still more units being built at a very nice high level. This has come back and uh, is going to continue to move higher. You're going to continue to sell product into multi-unit housing, just not at the same pace as we go forward. Non-residential construction, that 12-12 rate of change in orange has peaked and begun to edge lower. We're going to see the rate of rise bleed off from today's 14% down to 4.4% by the end of 2013. So dramatically slower rate of rise, but that still means that the dollar spend continues to rise. I annotated that for you to make sure that we got that. Recovery through 14, the amount of money being spent in non-residential construction will continue to move up, will continue to provide you with opportunities, just not at the same pace. And a quick tour through some of the bigger segments, office building construction. You can see from the rates of change, we're looking at them, there's more upside activity to go. The 312 is above the 1212. Orange above blue always is good for you. When we look at commercial construction, we have the orange below the blue. Uh, there's downside pressure coming in commercial buildings. When we look at hospitals, $25.5 billion holding steady, lots of work, lots of activity going on. And here's an overall chart for you for the different segments. Uh, notice the phase Ds. Those are the ones that are below year ago levels, continuing to see decline in the dollar spent. Total public construction. Then you drop to public health care spending, and then you drop to religious buildings. Um, it, it apparently, it's not a good time to get sick, and it's not a good time to build a new church. Other than that, we have slower rate of rise. We have flat uh, going on uh, in the private sector. Uh, the biggest problem is in malls, and that's tied with, the, with 
consumer spending is as tied with housing. That's going to continue to have some problems as we go through 2014. But I suspect you're going to find there's a nice mix of activity out there. Uh, your contractors, your clients are going to find things to bid. Um, you will be busy in the commercial segment uh, as you go forward, especially as you place and time um, uh, where you are with what's going on. Again, the quarterly reports deal with that. All right. Good. We left 15 minutes for Q&A, which was the plan. Mike, I love it when a plan comes together. The only plan you did such a great job, we have no questions in the queue right now, Alan. <laughs> uh, so those of you that are now uh, have questions, feel free to go ahead and type them into the uh, question box that you should see there on the right-hand side of your screen under the dashboard there. And we'll wait a few minutes. And if you have some questions, if not, we'll, we'll end the session. So. so we'll just hang tight right now. Sure, absolutely. The world's an interesting place. So, Alan, do you, are you still predicting, by the way, that in 2029 we're going to everything's going to collapse and and uh, all the kids are going to come back moving in with with uh, their parents in single family homes again? Because, uh. <laughs> Alan, that's the year I'm that's the year I'm looking to retire right around that time frame. So, I'm not looking for any kids to come back. I didn't know you were that much younger than me, Mike. Uh, the the <laughs> the answer is, uh, twenty twenty nine is a good time to be ready for it, or even a little before. But the the date right now is in the early twenty thirties. We just say twenty twenty nine, so you're ready ahead of time. Uh, but yes, there's no reason to not expect that that depression is still on, and that we're still headed towards the uh, equivalent of the nineteen thirties with tech, with great technology. We have a question uh, coming up here. Um, how big a correction do you feel that the stock market will have to make over? Uh, that's dangerously close to a forecast, but if I were to tell you in the 15 to 30 percent range, uh, hopefully uh, you would find that acceptable without uh, holding me to that as a firm forecast. A correction is over 10 percent. Uh, we are in print, but the ITR trend support is saying expect more in the 15 to 30 percent range. Alan, another question. Can you expand your discussion on the outlook of new home construction? Um, sure. Uh, we believe that new home construction is still a good bet long haul, that 14 is just an interruption. Low interest rates, availability of money, uh, the desire uh, in America, the culture to still own a home, those are all good things, and, and those feed the upside trend. The negatives come from, will we lose the interest rate deduction, mortgage interest rate deduction? Uh, and that causes some people to say, hmm, maybe this won't work as well for me. Harder to get a mortgage. Uh, needing to have more cash to get into that mortgage than you did before, courtesy of Dodd-Frank. Basel three requirements beginning uh, in 2014 will probably cause some tightening up of the credit markets in 2014, including bank lending on mortgages. And the fact that there's still a, a fair amount of foreclosure um, activity to be bled through, the banks are still owning and holding a fair amount of homes that we believe that they will just slowly bleed off. All of that says that uh, it's best not to get overexcited about the long, the immediate, excuse me, potential of the housing industry. While inventories are coming down nicely, the banks can be releasing more inventory through time uh, to offset the purchases. All so of which says. I'm sorry, go ahead. And as a follow-up to that, Jay asks, then, uh, is it a good time uh, for young people to buy a house or just to hang tight? Um, that will depend on who they are, but in general, my advice would be it's an excellent time to buy a house. I think prices are only going to face more upside pressure. Interest rates, mortgage rates are only going to face more upside pressure. It'll be harder to borrow in the future. So not knowing their financial condition, which is the only caveat, everything else being equal, uh, definitely buy that home by the end of the year. Make it the home that you want to live in for years to come, preferably the home that you will live in for the next 20 years. Stay where you are. Make it the three or four bedroom home if you plan on having a family, uh, two or three bedroom if you're not. Uh, get in there and enjoy it. Okay, hey, we've got to two more questions. Um... Uh, what about hotel construction and renovation? I know you kind of talked about non non residential, but can you elaborate a little bit more for thirteen and fourteen on those two markets? 
Uh, yes, I don't have those forecasts memorized, so I'm going to talk in general terms to those. But the hotel and motel uh, should see a, a definite slackening in the rate of rise. You can see on the screen in front of your private lodging is in phase C, is growing at a 24.5% pace. That's not sustainable. So while I don't know what that number is going to be by the end of the year off the top of my head, and I don't remember what the number is going to be for 14, uh, the word rising is likely to be there, but it's going to be replaced with milder rate of rise. The, the dollar spend should continue to uh, move up, or it may plateau. These people, by the way, I, I've looked at uh, hotels and motel spending before. They know the economy well, and they really pay attention to the business cycle. So. Uh, my outlook is rather consistent with history. I expect that to back off noticeably in terms of new contracts let in 14, which you know they would get let uh, start construction in 15 at a slower pace. It starts off slower in 15, second half of 15 better than the first half. Perfect. And the last question we have in the queue is, uh, what impact do you feel Obamacare will have on the industry? Uh, same that'll that have on on just about every industry. Um, in the nation, it has a uh, immediately. It has no impact on a lot of people because most firms are probably already in compliance with Obamacare rules and regulations. If you're over 50 employees, chances are you're in compliance. So there's no fines, penalties coming your way, but it will cost you more, nevertheless, as you make sure that you're in compliance and as you begin to have to deal with the paperwork and the issues that are involved. In the future, it'll make lots of firms. Uh, decide whether it is worthwhile just to pay the $2,000 penalty. You know, it's not quite as simple as that because the health care deduction is a tax deductible event and the penalty is not. But if you're a firm uh, with over 50 employees, you may want to begin to debate whether it's worth paying the $2,000 penalty, even though it's not deductible, then giving your employees an increase so they can go into the exchange and get their own insurance. And do it the hassle, streamline your operation, uh, really make your HR person happy, et cetera. For smaller firms, it's not an issue right now. But as the years go by, between now and 2019, the implications and the costs ramp up, and uh, it'll become more expensive even for smaller firms as we go forward. Uh, we can argue all day long whether this is good or not, needed or not, but the reality is it's a tax it's expensive. The government's not ready with their exchanges. You can't put anybody to an exchange yet because it doesn't exist. So businesses will be bearing the cost as we go forward. And uh, Alan, one more did pop up, and it looks like a good question. What's your opinion on debt now for future expansion? Uh, at the company level, it's a great idea. Just be wary of 2019. At this point in time, we think there's a noted a noticeable recession coming 2019, not another 2009, but still a recession. So if you're going to go into debt now, I would encourage you to do so. Rates are low. Have a six-year uh, payback, six-year renegotiation, so that you're renegotiating it in 2019, which will be the next trough in rates. Or make sure that the ROI on it is such that you have to cash to pay it off in 2018 so that you are uh, not carrying that debt into 2019 or you're generating so much cash from the debt that you, as you do your cash projections into 2019, you're still able to carry that debt and you will refi at a low rate. Two scenarios, pay it off or make sure that you're producing so much cash from the debt that you can carry this when business slows again noticeably in 2019. Great. Thank you, Alan. Uh, looks like we're up against our time limit. And uh, again, I'd like to thank all of you for participating. Alan, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, again, reminder, August 14th, 11 o'clock Eastern Time, we're going to be doing another webinar with Alan. And again, uh, Network ASA, October 2nd through the 4th in Washington, where Alan will start talking more about 2014. Again, we'll remind you all through email when the session is available online. And again, thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, Mike. Glad to be your economist. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.